Hi there, welcome back. Let's continue our discussion of functional anatomy of prokaryotic cells. Okay, I think we're picking it up with the um, with axial filaments. All right, now bacteria that have axial filaments are referred to as spirochetes. And I talked a little bit about this earlier in the lecture in, in our part one. And I talked about the fact that um, spirochetes are spiral shaped cells. They have a, um, uh, a sheath that um, wraps around the exterior of the cell and one or more of these structures known as axial filaments, they're going to lie within that sheath. Now axial filaments, they're sort of um, uh, slightly elastic. Uh, they are attached at one end of the cell um, and then they, they um, wrap around the cell within that sheath. And at the point of origin where the axial filaments are attached to the cell, they're attached at one end and not at the other, the axial filament rotates, all right? And so um, let's pretend this pencil is my spirochete. The axial filaments rotate and that causes the spirochetes to move in a corkscrew-like fashion, which happens to be very efficient for moving through body fluids like um, mucus, mucous membranes, um, the bloodstream, etc. Uh, now, certainly not all spirochetes are pathogenic, but um, some of them are. Uh, for example, there's a bacterium named Treponema pallidum, and it causes the um, sexually transmitted infection known as syphilis. All right, and you've got some uh, diagrams in your, um, in your notes and also some nice um, figures and additional information in your textbook. All right, uh, we're still talking about structures external to the cell wall. Next on my list are pili, also known as fimbriae. All right, not exactly the same thing. Um, some bacteria have fimbriae and pili. Fimbriae means um, fingers, and these are um, little hair-like projections that are attached to the cell uh, by means of a basal body, very similar to how flagella were attached to the cell. Um, and pili have sticky ends. Um, and while typically we don't think of motility associated with pili, apparently they are associated with some kinds of motility. Uh, bacteria with pili are sometimes observed to um, uh, undergo this sort of a twitching motility, or I've heard it de described as like a grappling hook, meaning um, you throw the hook out, you grab a hold of something, and then you, you kind of pull yourself in. So um, anyways, how about for our purposes, we say uh, pili, motility, not so much related. Uh, but they do have those sticky ends. Think, think of the ends of pili as sort of um, bacterial um, Velcro. Uh, remember how we talked just a little while ago about how capsules contribute to pathogenicity by helping the bacterium attach itself to an, its environment? Ditto for fimbriae. All right, now bacteria that have um, fimbriae are likely to have some pili as well. Um, fimbriae, pili, they're um, hollow, I already mentioned, attached to the cell by means of a basal body. Uh, made of a different protein though than flagella. The protein is called pilin. Now, pili, if they are present, there will only be a few of them. And they are somewhat longer than fimbriae, and they're involved in a process called conjugation, right? Bacteria that have pili are capable of um, interacting with other bacteria in this process known as conjugation. All right, now here's a little diagram, very simple. Hope you can read it. Uh, when I go back and I look at these videos, it looks to me like you can. But anyways, uh, we need two bacteria to um, have conjugation take place. And we don't really refer to bacteria as being male or female. Kind of a little weird for unicellular organisms. But we refer to them as mating strains. And the um, bacterium that's going to actually make a copy of it's uh, some of its DNA, and then donate that copy to a recipient cell. The donor cell, it's called the positive mating strain, and the recipient cell is the negative mating strain. Now, the positive mating strain uh, bacterium, it must have pili. The recipient or the negative mating strain cell, it may have pili or it may not. All right, now, um, I'm again having to get a little bit ahead of myself, but bacteria, uh, have two main sources of genetic information in their, um, in their cells. One would be what we call their main chromosome. Bacteria have a single circular chromosome. 
um, generally not attached in any meaningful way uh, to um, any other part of the cell, maybe to the inside of the plasma membrane, uh, but definitely not separated from the rest of the cell by means of a nuclear envelope, right? So all bacteria have that main chromosome. Some bacteria have tiny, maybe one one thousandth the size of the main chromosome, tiny extra uh, circular DNA molecules called plasmids. A little bit later on in this lecture, I will talk about plasmids in more detail. But anyways, generally it's plasmid DNA uh, that's going to be donated from one bacterium to another through conjugation. So what's happened here is uh, these two bacteria have come into contact by means of the sex pilus and the positive mating strain makes a copy of its plasmid. Uh, the copy is going to um, be transported through the sex pilus into the cytoplasm of the recipient cell. All right, so um, a few facts about pili. All right, some bacteria have pili, others don't. Uh, pili, um, I'm sorry, um, Okay, I'm back. I'm recording this um, this section of videos at home, and so there are dogs barking and phones ringing and things like that. But anyways, I'm back. All right, so we were talking about pili and conjugation, uh, and then I got distracted. All right, so as I said earlier, not all bacteria have pili. Bacteria that have pili are capable of conjugation. Oh, I know, another thing I wanted to mention is that Conjugation can occur between really any two bacteria, um, one having a sex pilus, of course. And what I mean by that is, is that they do not have to be members of the same species, all right? And so uh, what kinds of um, things, what kinds of uh, genetic information might be transmitted uh, through conjugation? Well, one of the things that's important to us is that uh, DNA, genetic instructions on how to resist the effects of antibiotics, that's one of the types of uh, information that can be transferred from one bacterium to another. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's see with, um, oh, one last note for pili, and that is, uh, and I think this is in your outline here, let me just double check. Um, um, yeah, it is in there. Uh, a, an example of a bacterium that has pili is one named Neisseria gonorrhea. And this is the bacterium that causes the sexually transmitted infection called gonorrhea. Okay, I've had enough of pili and I imagine you have too. So let's go ahead and move on to the bacterial cell wall. Okay, we can spend a little bit of time here. Uh, and let's start with some opening remarks, some facts about prokaryotic uh, cell walls. All right, most bacteria, not all, there are exceptions, most bacteria have a cell wall. And if it's present, the cell wall is a semi-rigid structure, uh, surrounds the plasma membrane, protects the cell from environmental stresses. Uh, it is a selectively permeable structure, and that means that some substances are able to cross that barrier, others cannot. Typically, that's gonna be determined by the, um, the size and the electrical charge um, of the um, whatever the substance molecule or ion it is that we're trying to um, move across the cell wall. Uh, the cell wall is going to be the site of attachment for the bacterial flagellum, at least the gram-negative uh, cell. Uh, it is the site of action for some antibiotics. Specifically, and I just want to see what uh, examples, yeah, that I've got in your notes. Specifically, drugs like penicillin and ampicillin and cephalosporin, there are others. Uh, they specifically target the gram-positive cell wall. More on that in a little while. <clears throat> All right, have I missed anything? Uh, why don't we now take a look at, there is a diagram in your handout packet. Take a look at it. And this is a diagram of a gram um, of a gram-positive cell wall and a gram-negative cell wall. And this is actually taken from an older version of your textbook. I think it's literally like the first edition of Tortora. And I use this one uh, rather than the newer one, which you should look at. There's a lot of detail there because it is, uh, it's just graphically 
uh, simpler, a little easier to get your head around. And my medical micro students, this is a possible essay question for them to draw and label the parts of the um, cell wall, bacterial cell wall. And I think this is just a little easier to deal with. All right, so what is all this gram business? Well, in the late 1800s, there was an early microbiologist. His name was Hans Christian Graham. And he is the one that invented this uh, staining technique that was eventually named after him, Graham staining. And what this technique does is it divides bacteria into two main groups. And the, uh, the basis for the division is the structural makeup of their cell wall. All right, so they're either gram positive or gram negative, and um, there are um, two stains, um, something called a mordant and a decolorizer that we use in the gram staining process. I'm sorry to keep saying this, but more on that later. Um, and um, when we're done with the gram staining process, gram positive cells will stain purple or blue, and gram negative cell walls will stain red or pink. All right, so let's take a look, uh, let's take a closer look at these diagrams. The gram positive cell wall is on, um, uh, as I'm looking at it, my left, the gram negative cell wall on the right. And down below both of the cell walls, we have a diagram of a plasma membrane. Keep this handy because we'll take another look at it in a little while. Now let's take a look at the gram positive cell wall. And if you look at that, you'll see that there are several layers of peptidoglycan. Now I've mentioned peptidoglycan um, a few times already. Let, let me just mention um, a, a little bit more detail about it. Uh, and, I, and I wrote some notes just so that I would um, make sure I got this right for you. Anyways, peptidoglycan, it's a, um, a macromolecular um, um, structure. It's a, it's a lattice-like structure. And it's made up primarily of um, polypeptide and polysaccharide. And um, the two main uh, components are uh, called NAG, and that stands for um, N-acetylglucosamide, that's NAG, and N-acetylmuramic um, acid, that's called, uh, the uh, I should say the acronym for that is NAM. So those are the two main components, and those molecules are going to be um, bound together in a lattice-like um, arrangement, and that uh, makes up the gram-positive cell wall. Gram-positive cell wall will have many layers of this peptidoglycan, and then we'll see another molecule called, uh, referred to as tachoic acids, um, interspersed um, throughout the gram-positive cell wall. And um, the tachoic acids, they play, um, I should mention the tachoic acids uh, have an electrical negative charge, and so um, ions with a positive charge can attach to those uh, tachoic acids and kind of um, um, weave their way through the, um, that lattice made up of peptidoglycan. So um, tachoic acids play a role in the transport of uh, some positively charged ions across the gram-positive cell wall. Uh, the gram-negative cell wall, if you take a look at the diagram, is structurally a lot more complex, made of two main components. There is a, um, um, a periplasmic space, and in that space we have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. Outside of the periplasmic space we have what's called an outer membrane. So the gram-negative cell wall is made up of the periplasmic space and the outer membrane. Now the outer membrane looks very much like the plasma membrane, doesn't it? Um, it's made up of two layers of phospholipid molecules. We're going to see um, large globular proteins embedded uh, every now and then in the gram-negative cell wall. They're called channel or pore proteins. Now, um, there are no tachoic acids in the gram-negative cell wall. And if you take a look at the, um, the channel protein in this diagram, what they're showing you is a longitudinal section. And the reason they've drawn it that way is so that you can see that there is a little tunnel or a channel uh, that runs through that channel protein. And so there are some substances that we can move across the gram-negative cell wall through those channel proteins. Uh, we have a number of molecules on the surface of the gram-negative cell wall. Uh, for example, um, um, the O antigen and lipopolysaccharide. Uh, and they um, play a, a number of... Um, uh, roles in the, uh, the life of the cell. Um, for our purposes, one of the um, things that these antigens on the surface of the gram-negative cell wall do for us is help us identify different strains of bacteria. And that uh, lipopolysaccharide, um, when an individual has a, an infection with gram-negative bacteria, 
the, um, uh, the, the death and the lysis of gram-negative cells, that the release of that um, uh, LPS into the, um, into the bloodstream of the infected individual can cause a fever response. Now, let me also point out that a fever can be the result of many other factors, but th that is one. All right, so that's our, um, our basic uh, gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls. So why don't we go ahead and now talk about bacteria with little or no cell wall. Okay, so as I've said a couple of times, most bacteria have a cell wall. And um, there are exceptions, though. And I've got two situations I wanted to explain. One is uh, bacteria that naturally lack cell walls. They just don't have a cell wall. That's just the way they are. That's normal for them. An example would be the bacterium named Mycoplasma pneumoniae. And it's a tiny little pleomorphic, doesn't have a cell wall, right? So it's kind of squishy. Um, pleomorphic cell, and even for a bacterium, it's very small. It is a common contaminant of uh, tissue cultures in, uh, in laboratories, clinical research labs. And um, it also causes a disease that's sometimes called atypical or walking pneumonia. And we'll talk about that disease later this semester. So mycoplasma pneumoniae naturally lacks a cell wall. All right. Now, in some cases, the lack of a cell wall or a complete cell wall anyways, is um, the product of exposure to antibiotics. Okay, let's talk about a scenario. I know that none of you would actually do this, but... There are people who, when they are prescribed antibiotics, let's say they were prescribed a 10-day course, uh, and let's say they took the antibiotics for five days, and then they say, hmm, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. I think I'll save the rest of those antibiotics for next time. This is not a smart thing to do. Uh, first of all, next time might be an infection caused by a totally different bacterium, but let's talk about this time. So anyways, you took the antibiotics for 10 days and after five, you're feeling much better. That's because many of the bacteria causing your infection have been killed by exposure to the antibiotics. But the ones that are left are the tough ones, the nasty, more resistant ones. And so if you stop taking the antibiotics, all you've done is kill off the weaklings. And the more resistant bacteria, uh, the stress is removed from their environment and their cell wall has been damaged. The, these cells are now referred to as L forms. That stands for the Lister Institute in, um, in France, I believe it is. Um, but anyways, these L forms have damaged cell walls and once the antibiotics are eliminated from the environment, they may be able to repair the cell wall. Uh, they may have um, uh, mutated to the point where they are now resistant to that uh, antibiotic, and they may be able to pass that information on to other bacteria. This is one of the main ways that antibiotic resistance is uh, transmitted from one bacterium to another through conjugation of um, mutated bacteria. Uh, so if you are prescribed antibiotics, take them all. Uh, we, you may have uh, not received the memo, uh, but we have a big problem with antibiotic resistance uh, and um, mostly it's our own fault. Okay, now let's talk about um, one last group of bacteria and then I think I'm gonna break because I think we may be approaching 20 minutes and I had a heck of a time uploading that last um, segment. But anyways, there is a group of bacteria that are referred to as being acid fast. Now I don't mean fast like running, I mean fast like hold on tight to something. Have you ever heard that expression hold fast? Well anyways that's what I'm talking about. All right, acid fast bacteria. Uh, they are gram positive and in addition to the many layered uh, peptidoglycan cell wall that gram positive bacteria have, these bacteria have um, a coating of a waxy substance surrounding their cell wall called mycolic acid. Mycolic acid is actually a type of lipid. Uh, and this uh, mycolic acid makes these bacteria very resistant to um, antiseptics, disinfectants, antibiotics. These are very drug-resistant bacteria. Now, uh, a staining technique was developed called acid-fast staining to help identify these bacteria uses a primary stain called carbyl fusion. And at the end of the acid-fast staining process, acid-fast cells will stain red, 
actually fuchsia would be uh, more technically correct, and non-acid fast cell stain blue. Now these color reactions have nothing at all to do with the gram stain reactions. Totally different chemicals are used in these uh, two processes. Some important pathogens are uh, acid fast bacteria. For example, there are a couple species in the genus known as mycobacterium that are significant pathogens. For example, mycobacterium tuberculosis causes TB and mycobacterium leprae causes a disease called leprosy. And there's another genus called nocardia and they are also acid fast bacteria and they cause um, tuberculosis like uh, respiratory infections. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and break uh, I'm sorry to have so many segments, but I, uh, I think it's uh, just easier to upload them and probably easier for you guys uh, to deal with as well. Oh, oh, one more thing. Here we go. Word for the day, or I should say term for the day, nosocomial infections. So what are they? They're also known as hospital-acquired infections, and these are infections usually caused by very drug-resistant bacteria that are acquired in a healthcare facility. So um, you go to a clinic, you go to a hospital for surgery or for some other procedure, and because of poor hygiene on uh, the part of one or more healthcare um, professionals or um, ineffective disinfection of equipment, you become infected with something that's probably even worse than what you came in with. Uh, okay, we can talk more about this when we're together in class. Thanks for now, and I'll be back soon with part three.